Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the uh, New York State Science and Technology Law Center asked me to uh, give a uh, presentation concerning the Prometheus versus uh, Mayo Clinic Supreme Court decision that was handed down in recent months. Uh, the Prometheus decision was, was widely watched by the biotechnology industry in general, but uh, as with uh, most Supreme Court worthy cases, it has uh, wide ranging implications from a policy standpoint with respect to the area of patentable subject matter or patent eligible subject matter. And uh, that's what I want to uh, discuss with you here today. Now, I noticed in the roster of uh, those of you out there who are uh, attending the, the webinar today, uh, we have many lawyers, but we also have many uh, scientists and um, laboratory personnel. So it, at the very least, I, I wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about the, the background of the Prometheus decision. But before I, I start, uh, I don't have a slide on this, but I, I just want to, to mention that what we're going to be talking about is a statute. It's it's Title 35 of the U.S. Code, Section 101, uh, which deals with the, the subject matter of patentable inventions. And uh, for those of you uh, who are not lawyers and may not be as familiar with the, the text of Section 101, it's a very short uh, section of the Patent Act and uh, is intended to be interpreted broadly. And what it states is, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof, may obtain a patent therefore subject to the conditions and requirements of this title. Therefore, Section 101 uh, deals with the subject matter of methodologies or processes, machines, manufacture, or compositions of matter, and improvements to those categories. Those are very broad terms. And that's the spirit with which Congress uh, enacted Section 101. And the uh, Prometheus decision, which is uh, in a series of, of Supreme Court cases that deal with the interpretation of this section, uh, is trying to, to give some shape to it. Now, the Prometheus versus Mayo decision uh, involves uh, this company called Prometheus Therapeutics and Diagnostics, uh, Prometheus Laboratories is located out in San Diego. It's an exclusive licensee of the two patents that were at issue uh, in this particular case. Uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and the Mayo Collaborative Services were the defendants. Uh, they had originally uh, purchased diagnostic test tests sold by Prometheus that embody the processes that the patents described. But then in 2004, they stopped purchasing those diagnostic text tests from Prometheus, developed their own uh, diagnostic tests, which were slightly different from the uh, Prometheus tests, and uh, sold these, uh, these tests. Subsequently, Prometheus sued them for patent infringement. Um, slide six. Is, is simply a snapshot of the front faces of the, the two patents at issue. Uh, you can see um, uh, the assignee on these is a, a hospital, a research hospital up in Montreal uh, that had ultimately licensed these uh, technologies that are, the, that are the subject of these two patents to uh, Prometheus out in San Diego. Both patents involve the use of uh, a a, a class of drugs called thiopurine drugs, uh, which are used in the treatment of auto, um, autoimmune diseases such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative uh, colitis and other uh, similar types of autoimmune uh, disorders. Uh, there was a discovery that there is a correlation between the concentration of metabolites, and metabolites are uh, things that get broken down in the bloodstream by the metabolism of the uh, thiopurine drug and the toxicity and efficacy of the particular drug. So if the concentration of the byproducts or the metabolites in the bloodstream in the patient is too low, uh, the current dosage of the thiopurine drug uh, is likely not uh, effective. And if the concentration of the metabolites is too high, 
uh, the dosage could be toxic to the patient. And therefore, you want to try and uh, come up with a, uh, a dosage that um, uh, is in a, a particular range, both uh, effective and non-toxic. The metabolites, the 6-TGN and 6-MMPN, uh, are the two metabolites that are broken down uh, as a consequence of the administration of the thiopurine drugs and uh, are present in the, uh, the bloodstream of the patients who have been administered thiopurine. Uh, both have been discovered to have risks of certain toxic uh, disorders when the uh, level of those particular metabolites uh, becomes too high. The 6-TGN metabolite uh, is shown to have a higher risk of, of myelotoxicity and the 6-MMPN metabolite uh, was discovered to have a particular risk of, of a hepatotoxicity. And the difficulty with the dosage comes in because different people metabolize the thiopurine drug differently. So no two patients necessarily are going to have uh, the same level of metabolites present in their bloodstream based upon the same level of dosage of the thiopurine drug. So there was, needed to have been a uh, test developed to determine the level of these particular metabolites in the bloodstream and then alter the dosage accordingly. And that's what the nature of the, uh, the two patents uh, deals with. On slide nine, you simply see uh, the graphic of the, um, the, the number, the quantity of uh, the metabolites in the bloodstream over a, a period of time. Uh, it relates to the uh, number of picomoles um, uh, of the metabolite presence uh, as compared to the red blood cell count in the particular patient. And you can see if the uh, range of the metabolites is in the 230 to 400 picomole uh, range, that's uh, been determined through uh, trial and error and discovery to be therapeutically uh, reliable and, and, and accurate. Anything above that, uh, you, you risk the toxic uh, effects and anything too low, uh, the thiopurine drug is simply not uh, doing its intended job. Now the patents, the 302 and the 623 patents, uh, have claims that are very, very similar uh, to one another. And uh, this, this one uh, slide 10 characterizes the common elements amongst the claims. The claims are method claims. They involve two steps. The first step being an administration step or an administering step in which the drug is given to patients. So a doctor gives uh, the patient uh, thiopurine of a, a, a particular dosage. Secondly, the second step in the process is to determine the level of concentration of the metabolites in the patient. And this is not uh, specified how you do this in the, in the patents. It's simply you administer the drug, you measure, you take a blood test and measure the, the, the level of metabolites present in the bloodstream. Uh, you then compare the level of metabolites to the, the claimed ranges that were discovered to, to show efficacy and non-toxicity. And the physician can then increase or decrease the amount of the drug that's given to the patient depending on that particular comparison. Claim one of the 623 patent was the representative claim uh, treated in the uh, decision. This claims a method of optimizing therapeutic efficacy for treatment of an immune-mediated gastrointestinal disorder comprising the steps of administering a drug providing the 6-thioguanine to a subject having said immune-mediated gastrointestinal disorder and then determining the level of 6-thioguanine in said subject having said immune-mediated gastrointestinal disorder. We are in the level of 6-thioguanine less than about 230 picomoles per uh, certain quantity of red blood cells indicates a need to increase the amount of the drug and we're in the level of 6-thioguanine greater than 400 picomoles per uh, a certain level of red blood cell count indicates a need to decrease the amount of said drug subsequently administered to the patient. So the steps are administering and determining, and then the where in clauses are providing uh, the instruction to the doctor as to what to do based upon the comparison of the level of metabolite in the bloodstream as compared to the uh, range that was uh, determined to be uh, 
the, the efficient range or the, the uh, efficacious range. Now, in uh, the Prometheus litigation, it started in the district court for the Southern District of California out in San Diego. And in this particular case, this is the trial level court, and uh, that's where Prometheus sued the Mayo uh, Clinic. Um, and in May of 2008, the, uh, the district court in the Southern District of California handed down a, a decision and memorandum uh, in respect to a motion for summary judgment that was made by the Mayo Clinic uh, asking the court to declare as a matter of law that the patents at issue were invalid as uh, not directed towards patent eligible subject matter. Uh, the district court granted this summary judgment motion uh, it, thereby invalidating the claims of the uh, patents in suit uh, on the basis of them not claiming uh, patent eligible subject matter. Uh, Prometheus took its appeal to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit on slide, uh, whatever slide number we're on here. Um, you can see the, the up arrow pointing to that 2009 Federal Circuit 1 uh, decision. Uh, it's slide 12. And uh, they rendered a decision in 2009 that oh, uh, rejected the uh, district court's opinion and uh, overturned the district court's opinion and held that the claims do indeed uh, recite patent eligible subject matter. Uh, in response to this appellate level court's decision, uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic petitioned the Supreme Court for certiorari, asking the Supreme Court to review the Federal Circuit's uh, decision that these particular uh, claims were, in fact, uh, directed towards patent-eligible subject matter. So the Supreme Court won in 2010, uh, granted, vacated, and remanded. That's called a GVR order in view of the Bilski decision. Now, Bilski was another uh, Supreme Court case dealing with patent-eligible subject matter that came down in this interim period of time. Uh, and in light of that particular decision, uh, the Mayo uh, Clinic said, Supreme Court, you should uh, tell the Federal Circuit that they need to relook at this because uh, the Supreme Court, you just decided Bilski and there's a change in law. And the way the Federal Circuit uh, decided this case was based upon an er erroneous interpretation uh, it's contrary to the precedent that you just set in the Bilski decision. So uh, they petitioned, uh, it was granted, vacated, and remanded by the Supreme Court in 2010, went back down to the Federal Circuit for a second look at it in light of the Bilski opinion, and the Federal Circuit ended up uh, deciding the case the same way it decided it the first time. It said, the, this does pass what we call the machine or transformation test. It said the bloodstream is metabolizing the uh, drug, and that's a transformation of the uh, blood product. And that transformation of the blood product was uh, sufficient in the eyes of the, the justices of the Federal Circuit to uh, say that it passed muster under Section 101. It was patent eligible as a consequence of that. Um, in light of uh, the second Federal Circuit opinion in 2010, uh, the Mayo Clinic once again petitioned the Supreme Court for certiorari and said, well, you know, the, the, the Federal Circuit looked at it again, uh, and they decided it the same way they decided it the first time, but uh, there really is no transformation here. All they're doing is claiming the law of nature, and uh, they're not uh, applying the Bilski uh, standard that came out of the Supreme Court appropriately or correctly. So, uh, Supreme Court, you should take another look at this, and the Supreme Court agreed, and it did. And that leads us to the most recent decision of the Supreme Court, that should say Supreme Court 2, not Supreme Court 1, uh, in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. Uh, so its second opinion is the one that, that we now are uh, going to be discussing. Um, again, a quick recap. District Court, Southern District of California, held that the Mayo's test did, in fact, infringe the patent, but the patents were directed towards natural laws or natural phenomena, and therefore were not patent eligible. Summary judgment, therefore, granted to the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Federal Circuit reversed, Supreme Court's GVR order in slide 15, uh, vacated it, remanded it to the Federal Circuit for further consideration, 
and uh, the Federal Circuit again reversed the district court decision, as I, as I stated a moment ago. Uh, the asserted claims are, in effect, claims to methods of treatment, which are always transformative when one of a defined group of drugs is administered to the body to ameliorate the effects of an undesired condition. That was the quote from the Federal Circuit in holding that there was, in fact, uh, a transformation that occurred that, that made it pass muster under uh, the Bilski standard. Then we get to the decision of the Supreme Court. Okay. The Supreme Court held uh, that the claims at issue in this Prometheus patent patents uh, were indeed uh, nothing more than, than the recitation of a law of nature. The law of nature being the relationship between the concentrations of certain metabolites in the blood and the likelihood that a dosage of a thiopurine drug will prove ineffective or cause harm. The relationship is a consequence of the ways in which thiopurine compounds are metabolized by the body, which is an entirely natural process. There was no inventive uh, step involved in identifying this particular correlation. If we move to slide 19, uh, claim one of the 623 patent was analyzed, and in looking at a step A of the process, administering a drug providing uh, six thioguanine to a subject having said immune-mediated gastrointestinal disorder, uh, the Supreme Court had to say this relative to that particular step. The administering step simply refers to the relevant audience, namely doctors who treat patients with certain diseases with thiopurine drugs. Again, it's not uh, claiming anything inventive. The uh, patentee doesn't even claim that uh, it invented the idea of administering a particular drug to a patient. It was well understood that you would administer thiopurine drugs. Uh, the prohibition against patenting abstract ideas cannot be circumvented by attempting to limit the use of the formula to a particular technological environment, uh, quoting the Bilski decision. Now here they're saying, well, if you say that the step is limited because we're talking about the administration of a particular drug, uh, to a subject having a particular disorder, in other words, a field of use limitation, uh, that in and of itself is not going to magically transform an otherwise natural process into a patent eligible process as a consequence of that. So trying to uh, evade um, the ability to overcome the, the exclusions to Section 101 by uh, using certain types of words in the drafting of the claim, or the, they refer to it as the artful drafting of the, of the patent claims. Form over substance, in other words. Continuing with the, the claim one of the 623 patent, the, the court then looked at the wherein clauses. We are in the level of 6 thioguanine less than about 230 picomoles per 8 times 10 to the 8th level of red blood cells, indicates a need to increase the amount and uh, greater than about 400 picomoles uh, per uh, 8 times 10 to the 8th red blood cells indicates a need to decrease the amount of the drug administered. The wherein clauses, according to the court, simply tell a doctor about the relevant natural law, at most adding a suggestion that he should take those laws into account when treating his patient. Again, not magically transforming uh, the discovery of these metabolite levels and their effects on, on individuals uh, into something inventive as opposed to something that occurs naturally uh, as, a, as a result of, of science. It's not an application of the law, but simply the law itself. Now, relative to the uh, determina determination step, determining the level of 6-thioguanine in the subject having said immune-mediated gastrointestinal disorder, uh, the court said the determining step simply tells the doctor to engage in well-understood, routine, and conventional activity that doctors had been doing long before the patent had ever come about. Purely conventional or obvious pre-solution activity is normally not sufficient to transform an unpatentable law of nature into a patent eligible application of the law. Now again, uh, the, the deterministic step here is, it doesn't tell you how to determine it, it doesn't limit it to a particular uh, assay that had been developed, uh, for instance, or a particular uh, system of apparatus that might be utilized 
in the determination step. It's simply the step of, of drawing the determination or making the determination. And the making of the determination is, in fact, what was discovered through a naturally occurring process. The Supreme Court looked back to its controlling precedent on Section 101 decisions, Diamond versus Deere and Parker versus Fluke being uh, two of the, the more comparable 101 cases that the Supreme Court's ha uh, decided over the years. Diamond v. Deere was decided in 1981, and the technology in that particular uh, case was determined to be patent eligible. And in Parker versus Fluke, a 1978 case, the technology that was claimed there was determined to be patent ineligible under Section 101. In Deere, Diamond versus Deere, uh, the technology related to a methodology for molding raw rubber products into molded products uh, using a, a known formulation called Arrhenius's equation. Uh, using this known mathematical equation, Arrhenius's equation, determine when to open a press that was being used to mold the raw rubber uh, into a molded product. So uh, the claim at issue in Diamond versus Deere had all of the steps associated with having to take the raw rubber, put it into a, uh, a kiln or some sort of baking apparatus, uh, having temperature probes on it, and having those temperature probes provide a constant feedback of, of a temperature variable to a computing unit, which would then uh, utilize Arrhenius' equation to produce uh, the outcome of that temperature variable in the equation. And then once uh, the threshold for the curing of the raw rubber into the molded product had been reached, an alarm would be triggered and the mold would be opened and therefore the pressure and temperature would be uh, released. So there was a lot of uh, machine elements and a lot of uh, inventive structure built into the methodology associated in the patent with Diamond v. Deere. And uh, the court held while the basic mathematical equation, Arrhenius' equation, was not patentable, the overall process was patentable because all of the additional steps integrated that particular equation. There was no suggestion that the steps were in context obvious, already in use, or purely conventional steps uh, that were being uh, taken in the, in, the, in the Diamond v. Deere case. And this was compared to uh, the Prometheus case, where the administration and the determination were, in fact, uh, well-known, already in use, and purely conventional uh, steps that any doctor would take in, in treating a, a his or her patient. In other words, with respect to the Diamond DV Deere case, the patentees did not seek to preempt the use of the equation, but instead transformed the process into an inventive application of the formula. So there was some sort of uh, applied science or applied engineering that uh, was claimed. They were part of the words of the claim of the uh, particular invention involved there that, that moved it beyond uh, simply the law of nature itself into uh, a particular uh, useful and concrete application of that law. They then, the Supreme Court in Prometheus uh, then analyzed Parker versus Fluke, went back and looked at that precedent. Parker versus Fluke uh, involved technology, a process uh, that adjusted alarm limits in a catalytic conversion process of hydrocarbons. Now, the mathematical equation here was admittedly not patentable. They, did, they, they were utilizing a well-known mathematical equation to, to uh, perform the catalytic conversion of the hydrocarbons. And the overall process that was claimed here also was not patentable because it didn't do anything other than uh, apply the formulation to update an alarm limit relative to the conversion process. Uh, it did not contain all of the steps associated with any of the uh, human engineering that went into determining the particular process. All of the steps were well-known steps. In other words, there, there was nothing uh, admittedly uh, novel other than the application of the formula. The application of the formula was considered by the inventor to be the invention, and the application of the formula is uh, not enough. In Parker versus Fluke, 
the court talked about post-solution activity as opposed to Prometheus where they talk about pre-solution activity. The post-solution activity that is purely conventional or obvious uh, according to the Parker v. Fluke Supreme Court uh, cannot transform an unpatentable principle into a patentable process. Now applying Diamond v. Deere and Parker v. Fluke to the claims at issue in Prometheus uh, the court said, well, our claims here in Prometheus look a lot more like the claims that were at issue in, in Parker v. Fluke and a lot less like the claims that were at issue in Parker uh, in Diamond v. Deer. The claims in Prometheus uh, simply tell a doctor to measure somehow. They don't tell you how to do the measurement, but they say measure uh, the current level of the relevant metabolite. Use the law of nature to calculate the current toxicity or uh, ineffective limit. And then reconsider the drug dosage in, load of, in light of this known law. Uh, the court said these instructions add nothing specific to the law of nature other than what is well understood routine conventional activity previously engaged in by those in the field. There's been a lot of critics of the Prometheus decision uh, saying the Supreme Court has overstepped its bounds in effectively legislating Section 101 as opposed to interpreting Section 101 uh, because uh, the, the, the critics of the Prometheus decision uh, look at a statement like this. These instructions add nothing specific to the laws of nature other than what is well understood routine conventional activity previously engaged in by those in the field. And they state, well, Section 101 says that a uh, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, et cetera, is entitled uh, to a patent subject to other conditions and requirements of the, of the Patent Act. Well, this is, in fact, a process. There's, a, there's a, an ordered step, ordered steps for doing something to achieve a, a result. And that, to the critics of the Prometheus decision, should be uh, enough to satisfy the plain language of Section 101 and to the, to the extent all of the steps are routine, conventional activity previously engaged in by those in the field, uh, the critics of the Prometheus decision say that should be left to a determination under Section 102 and or 103 and or Section 112 of the Patent Act. Section 102, uh, for those of you uh, not so familiar with the, the, the patent statute itself, Section 102 is the uh, portion of the Patent Act that defines what an invention uh, needs to meet in order to be deemed novel or new. And Section 103 uh, specifies what an invention needs to, to meet in order to be deemed non-obvious over the prior art. And then Section 112 uh, deals with the technical requirements as to the level of disclosure uh, present in the uh, claims and in the specification of the, of the patent itself. So, if it, if it is routine, if it is conventional, if it's previously engaged in, well, it's still patent eligible because it's a process. It might not be novel, though. In other words, why don't we let Section 102 and or Section 103, the novelty and non-obviousness requirements, be our uh, filters rather than saying that this particular process uh, is not eligible because we feel it, it comes too close to usurping a, a law of nature. And that's where the, uh, the policy decisions come into play. Um, now, in uh, Prometheus, there were other considerations that the court uh, took into account. The court considered several other case, uh, cases, namely the Nielsen case, the Bilski case, and the Benson case. Uh, and they, they didn't go into any detail in those cases, simply uh, indicating that these other cases, these other Supreme Court 101 cases, offer further support for the view that simply appending conventional steps specified at a high level of generality to laws of nature cannot make those laws in and of themselves patentable. The concern of the Supreme Court from a policy standpoint is that the patent laws should not inhibit further discovery by improperly tying up the future use of laws of nature. In the particular case at, at hand, the claims tell the doctor to measure metabolite levels and consider the resulting measurements in light of the correlation, i.e. the law of nature. This threatens, according to the court, uh, to inhibit the development of more refined treatment recommendations 
such as the one that Mayo uh, later used, because the Mayo Clinic did um, advance the state of the art, so to speak, by coming up with a, a different test for uh, determining the, the level of metabolites. Um, and if the claims drafted at the level of breadth that the claims were drafted in, in the Prometheus case, were allowed to stand uh, on patent eligibility grounds, um, coupled with the idea that perhaps they were, uh, there, there was no publications prior to uh, anticipate or render obvious uh, the particular claim because the discovery was um, uh, somewhat new, then uh, that would inhibit this kind of future development. Now, the Federal Circuit's transfer transformation test, the, the Federal Circuit had held that the steps of administering a drug to a patient and determining the level uh, do indeed involve transformation of the human body or of the blood taken from the body. Uh, the Supreme Court, by contrast, uh, held that there was no transformation occurring as a consequence of the administration step or the determination step. Administering simply helps to pick out the group of individuals who are likely interested in applying the law of nature, and the determining step, according to the Supreme Court, could be satisfied without transforming the blood should science develop a totally different system for determining metabolite levels that did not involve such a transformation. So again, perhaps if the claims had included more specific details associated with the manner in which the determination was done and or the way the administration was done, uh, it would have passed muster under Section 101, but because they were drafted so broadly in terms of simply administering, determining, and then based upon the observation uh, after the determination step, uh, altering the dosage according to the, to the law of nature, uh, it was determined by the uh, Supreme Court not to, to be transformative in any meaningful way. Now, in the, uh, there was a lot of amicus or friends of the court, so to speak, briefs filed at the Supreme Court prior to the argument uh, at the Supreme Court relative to this case. There, there was a lot of industry groups obviously quite interested in the outcome here. And the United States itself uh, has an interest in the case and filed a uh, amicus brief with the government arguing that any step beyond a bare statement of a law of nature should make the claims eligible and that the filtering, as I uh, mentioned before, where the policy debate comes down, uh, should be done by the novelty, non-obviousness, and written description uh, slash enablement requirements of uh, the patent statute itself. Uh, the court, in response to the US government's position uh, simply said that the approach would eviscerate the law of nature exception to section 101 and that its prior cases have relied on section 101 for these kinds of determinations, not on uh, novelty, non-obviousness, and uh, written description slash enablement uh, grounds. Um, one uh, aspect of this court's concern of the evisceration uh, of the law of nature, uh, exception to section 101, uh, some uh, critics of the decision, again, would say, who cares? Maybe you should eviscerate the law of nature exception. The law of nature exception is not written into the statute. You're not overturning a statute as being unconstitutional or otherwise invalid. Law of nature is judge-made law. It comes out of prior Supreme Court decisions and there's less of a concern in uh, eviscerating prior decisions that may have been uh, made poorly as compared to uh, second guessing what Congress has determined to be the best course of action uh, for the, the country in the drafting and the passage of a, an enactment of a particular statute. So again, uh, the opponents still attack the court uh, based on this concern that um, adopting the, the, the U.S. government's position relative to these particular claims uh, would be eviscerating a, a law of nature exception because, again, the law of nature exception is not statutory. Uh, it's something that the court itself had made up. So reversing bad law, bad case law, so to speak, uh, is not necessarily a bad thing. It may be time to, to consider doing that. 
another interesting thing about the position that the United States uh, took in its amicus brief is it probably was done with consideration of the representatives of the United States. And therefore, uh, its potential could be that Congress may uh, try and, and uh, write some new law that uh, codifies the position that it was taking in that particular amicus brief. So we'll have to wait and see. Ultimate holding, claims are invalid under Section 101, Federal Circuit's judgment reversed. Now, what's happened since March, the aftermath of the Prometheus decision? It's still very early, but there's been some uh, aftermath already. If a law of nature is not patentable, then neither is a process reciting a law of nature unless that process has additional features that provide practical assurance that the process is more than a drafting effort designed to monopolize the law of nature itself. Can't draft a law of nature together with well-known elements or as part of a prior art process and expect it to be patent eligible. One of the takeaways. The claim must include more than a general instruction to apply a law of nature. It must transform a process into an inventive application of the formula. But the Prometheus court did not provide us with an opinion that offers clear guidance as to what types of activities will transform a process into an inventive concept that goes beyond the law of nature. In this case, they said more like deer, or what we have taken away from it is we want claims that are more like the claims in Diamond v. Deer, less like the claims in Parker v. Fluke. Those were the guideposts that the court here was utilizing. Uh, it didn't move the ball much beyond those uh, particular guideposts. Now, post Prometheus, the Supreme Court has acted on a couple of occasions. A case called Wild Tangent, Inc. versus Ultramercial, LLC. 2011, the Federal Circuit held that claims for a method of monetizing copyrighted products involve steps that would require complex computer programming and thus did not claim a mathematical algorithm, a series of purely mental steps, or any similarly abstract concepts. So the, Supreme, the Federal Circuit held the claims at issue in that particular case to be patent eligible. Uh, Wild Tangent, the defendant in that particular case, uh, petitioned the Supreme Court because after the Federal Circuit's decision was handed down, uh, the Supreme Court decided the Prometheus case uh, in light of the Supreme Court's uh, Prometheus decision, again, the Supreme Court issued a GVR order, uh, granted, vacated the Federal Circuit de decision, and then remanded uh, the case to the Federal Circuit once again. That case currently sits before the Federal Circuit. We'll have to wait and see how they come down and uh, perhaps get some more Federal Circuit precedent on, on the interpretation of Prometheus there. A second case. Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics. Again, 2011, Federal Circuit opinion held that claims covering isolated gene sequences were, were valid, patent eligible, and that the claims for the diagnostic methods that compare or analyzes, analyze the sequences are not uh, valid, they're not transformative. Uh, again, petition was made to the Supreme Court in view of Prometheus, and the Supreme Court issued a, a GVR order remanding it to the uh, Federal Circuit for reconsideration in light of Prometheus. That case, too, is currently before the Federal Circuit. So we, we again, will be uh, keeping our eyes posted for the, the Federal Circuit's interpretation of Prometheus in that case. A couple of district court cases have also uh, been handed down since March on 101 grounds, Nozomi Communications versus Samsung and Smart Gene Inc. versus Advanced Biological Labs. Um, the uh, Samsung case was out of the Northern District of California and the uh, Smart Gene case is out of the District for the District of Columbia. Um, since the court did not provide clear guidance as to what or how many extra elements or combination of elements are needed to uh, transform the law of nature into patent-eligible claims. Much of this is going to play out in these district court cases, 
And in uh, the Nozomi case, uh, the Prometheus decision was simply uh, mentioned in the final paragraph of the decision in distinguishing between processes that are patent eligible and those that are impermissibly broad the Prometheus court focused on whether the process contains additional steps that transform the process from one that preempts all use of a natural law into an inventive application of the formula. And the Prometheus court rejected the claims at issue because the claims did little more than recite a law of nature and add the instruction, apply that law. Uh, the claim at issue in that particular case, a method of executing instruction comprising obtaining from an instruction storage location an instruction that references a data structure, the data structure storing an indication of a reference that may need resolution, obtaining data from the data structure including data from a resolution data field, using data from the resolution data field as an index to a jump table to determine whether to do a resolving step and if the data uh, resolution fields indicate that the reference was not resolved, resolving the reference and thereafter modifying the data in the data structure, including modifying the data in the resolution data field to indicate that the reference is uh, resolved. The court in the Nozomi case, the district court held that the claims do more than recite an abstract idea and say apply it, rather they recite specific steps that combine the claims to a specific useful uh, application. And if you look at the detail in, on slide 40 of that particular claim uh, relative to the software product that was at issue there or the methodology uh, practiced by the software, uh, you can see that there is uh, quite specific uh, structure associated with uh, the invention. So it's not a surprising result. Smart Gene versus Advanced Biological Labs had a much more detailed discussion of the Prometheus uh, case. The Prometheus court distilled the guidepost from its earlier Section 101 cases into the following warnings. The Supreme Court warned against interpreting patent statutes in ways that make patent eligibility depend simply on the draftsman's art without reference to the principles underlying the pro prohibition against patents for natural laws and warned against upholding patents that claim processes that too broadly preempt the use of a natural law. Again, this is the uh, argument of form over substance. We want to, to look at the substance and not merely the form of the claim. And the other warning is that a process that focuses upon the use of a natural law must contain other elements or a combination of elements, sometimes referred to as an inventive concept, sufficient to ensure that the patent in practice amounts to significantly more than a patent upon the natural law itself. The claim at issue in Smart Gene a method for guiding the selection of a therapeutic treatment regimen for a patient with a known disease or medical condition, the method comprising providing patient information to a computing device. The computing device comprises a first knowledge base comprising a plurality of different therapeutic treatment regimens, all of which are known and conventional. A second knowledge base comprising a plurality of expert rules for evaluating and selecting a therapeutic treatment regimen for the disease, again, all of which are well known and understood in the art. A third knowledge base comprising advisory information useful for the treatment of a patient with different constituents of said different therapeutic treatment regimens, again, all of which are uh, well known in, in, uh, in the art and generating in the computing device a ranked listing of available therapeutic treatment regimens for said patients and generating in said computing device advisory information for one or more therapeutic treatment regimens in the ranked listing based on the patient information and the expert rules. Applying Prometheus, the court held that the steps describe abstract ideas that are commonly performed by medical professionals in evaluating, considering, and constructing treatment options for a patient presenting a specific medical condition. Accordingly, the steps consist of well-understood routine conventional activity already engaged in by the scientific community, and those steps, when viewed as a whole, had nothing significant beyond the sum of their parts taken separately, uh, quoting the Prometheus case. Uh, if we go back to slide 43, the method for guiding the selection of the therapeutic treatment regimen, again, step A, step B, and step C, with step A having the most meat in it, so to speak, 
uh, this first knowledge base, second knowledge base, and third knowledge base. Uh, the court in uh, Smart Gene really was holding that each, even though there's a lot of words there, all of those words and all of the, the technology that went into the creation of this particular product uh, were not doing anything, in the words of the claim, other than doing what was already done mentally by uh, practitioners in the art. This claim, in my opinion, comes uh, even closer to the, the line than the claims in Prometheus, uh, where perhaps the government's argument that we should be using the novelty and non-obviousness uh, rules as filters as opposed to the Section 101 patent eligibility rules. Uh, this this uh, particular set of claims comes uh, presents a more uh, uh, difficult case or a difficult uh, type of invention to, to, to determine under the, the guidance we've received from the Supreme Court. Um, they probably would fail under the obviousness standard if they were determined to be patent eligible because there's no limitations in this particular claim as to how the software actually operates to do these particular steps. Uh, but if there was perhaps new data structures like we saw in the Samsung case that were altered as a consequence of the inputs being made into the computer system and those uh, data structures and the modification of those data structures were in fact uh, part of the claimed invention, maybe this one too would have passed muster. And it's probably not um, uh, much different than the way the technology actually works, but because the claims were drafted so broadly, uh, they fell. Now, moving on to uh, slide 45, uh, the Patent and Trademark Office uh, post Prometheus has uh, acted a little bit. It, it issued a three page memorandum dated March 21, so right on the, the heels of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, they summarized the holding of the Prometheus case in the memo stated to the examining corps, the claimed processes containing laws of nature are not patent eligible unless they have additional features that provide practical assurances that the processes are genuine applications of those laws rather than drafting efforts designed to monopolize the laws of nature. It's not a terribly helpful memorandum, but I think the uh, patent office wanted to provide some, some guide guidance and the examination of patent applications on the heels of it. Uh, they will be issuing further guidelines down the road. Um, again, in that uh, PTO post Prometheus uh, guidelines, examiners should continue to examine patent applications for compliance with Section 101 using the existing interim Bilski guidance that were issued uh, by the Patent Office back on July 27, 2010, factoring in the additional considerations below. The examiners must continue to ensure that claims are not directed towards an exception to eligibility, such as a claim amounts to a monopoly on the law of nature, the natural phenomena, or the abstract idea itself. To be eligible, a claim that includes an exception should include other elements or combination of elements such that in practice, the claimed product or process amounts to significantly more than the law of nature with conventional steps specified at a high level of generality appended there too. And as I mentioned, there's more to come. The UP at USPTO is continuing to study the decision in, in the Mayo uh, case and the body of case law that has evolved since Bilski and is developing further detailed guidance on patent subject matter. So uh, we do expect to see uh, additional guidance coming out of the patent office in terms of the manner in which the examiners will be uh, acting on uh, Section 101 uh, type rejections. The PTO's take home, a claim that includes a law of nature, a natural phenomena, or an abstract idea should include other elements or combination of elements such that in practice, the claimed product or process amounts to significantly more than a law of nature, uh, a natural phenomena, or an abstract idea with conventional steps specified at a high level of generality appended thereto. So strategically, with respect to claims, uh, Claims that simply compare or analyze information or data or otherwise have no transformative step uh, are certainly going to be subject to attack under Section 101 
at the PTO or during the course of litigation by the courts. Uh, an example being a diagnostic claim, detecting a genetic mutation and correlating it with a probability of a disease. So you look at a particular chromosome and the, uh, the particular mutation of the DNA on that chromosome and say there's a higher likelihood for disease X. That correlation is indeed a law of nature and sequencing DNA is routine and conventional activity, not likely to pass muster. You're going to want to draft a variety of claims of different scopes to try and ensure that you at least have some in there that, that get over the hurdle. Draft claims to include a sufficiently novel transformative element that applies the law of nature. Ask yourself whether the claim is directed to something more than the routine and conventional laboratory or diagnostic activity. And emphasize that the claim diagnostic applications of a correlation were previously poorly understood, were not routine and conventional activity that doctors and researchers had been doing, uh, that, had, that doctors and researchers had been doing prior to the inventive methodology uh, that's the subject of the uh, patent application. For personalized medicine or uh, diagnostic inventions, you could, should consider drafting treatment claims rather than or in addition to the diagnostic claims. In Prometheus, for example, the claims could have been uh, treatment claims by adding a step of adjusting the drug or otherwise treating the patient using the metabolite information, uh, such as increasing the subsequent dose of said drug when said level of uh, 6-thioguanine is less than a member selected from the group consisting of about, et cetera, picomoles per uh, quantity of red blood cells. It's not clear whether that kind of a limitation would in and of itself have been enough or would have been considered routine and conventional. My, my gut is it probably would have been considered routine and conventional and not uh, pushed it past the hurdle, but it would have been uh, closer than the manner in which the, the claim was originally uh, drafted and, and issued by the patent office. Now, when you're dealing with uh, medical uh, treatment claims, you have to be mindful of the uh, exception, the medical practitioner exception to infringement with respect to a medical practitioner's performance of a medical activity that constitutes an infringement under uh, sections 271A and B or B of the title. The provisions of sections 281, 283, 284, and 285 shall not apply against the medical practitioner or against a related healthcare entity with respect to the medical activity. This is in Title 35 USC 287C. While the medical practitioner exception may not include uh, assays, such as the one that was at issue in Prometheus, it can include other diagnostic methods. Uh, in the exception, medical activity means the performance of a medical or surgical procedure on a body, but shall not include the use of a patented machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter in violation of the patent, the practice of a patented use of a composition of matter in violation of the patent, or the practice of a process in violation of a biotechnology patent. On a body in that section typically is not interpreted to include assays that are performed on samples taken from the body. So again, just to understand the, the nature and scope of that medical practitioner exception when drafting claims uh, is, is cer certainly something to bear in mind and it's a good time to revisit that. And if there are any uh, questions, I can field them now. I think we have a few minutes. What's your opinion about the Prometheus decision? Do you agree that it wasn't a law of nature? Uh, I, I personally don't have any trouble with the Prometheus decision at all. A lot of people do. Um, I thought the claims were just drafted far too broadly than, and went beyond what was actually invented and did, in fact, uh, simply claim uh, the naturally occurring phenomena of the, of the metabolite level uh, being discovered. Um, I think there was an invention there. They just didn't claim it. And um, certainly if they'd claimed the, the diagnostic test that they actually came up with in terms of the structure of that test and the, uh, the probes that were used in that particular test, uh, it would have passed muster under 101 and perhaps would have been novel and non-obvious uh, under 102 and 103. Um, but it may not have covered what the Mayo Clinic ultimately did 
in terms of its um, uh, new test that it developed. That, that remains to be seen. But because they they chose to claim it so broadly, I, I didn't I didn't personally have an issue with it. Um, can you address algorithms in terms of um, making a determination based on some kind of a test that's, um, uh, you know, and how they would be addressed by uh, this pro mm -hmm. process? Well, algorithms, uh, you, you know, are processes. So algorithms um, are okay. Now, the, the, the court, when in its early days, back in the 70s, when it was first coming out with these 101 cases, uh, did say that algorithms per se are not eligible for patent protection, but uh, because the word algorithm is such a loaded term, um, they've kind of backed away from that kind of language. Now, uh, algorithms can be okay, uh, assuming the process that defines the algorithm uh, includes enough of the human engineering in the application of an otherwise known mathematical principle or scientific law uh, to be inventive. And again, if you're claiming it in terms of the methodology or in terms of the article of manufacture or the machine uh, or the composition of matter that results from the, uh, the human engineering, uh, you'll be fine. But certainly the Prometheus decision, while in the biotech field it's most applicable to, um, it can certainly be expanded and will make uh, software-related inventions, as an example, uh, a bit more challenging. Okay. okay, well, I think that is it, and we can't thank you enough. And um, if there are, uh, the, the webcast will be posted within the next two weeks, so that if um, any, we did get one complaint about sound, but I think that was based on their own uh, computer, so if anyone else I'd like to see it. Um, it'll be up within two weeks on the MISSDLC website. And thank you again, George. Very good. Thank you.